My name is Chase Haygood. I'm the Assistant Director for Faculty Development and Recognition in the Center for Teaching and Learning. We are just absolutely thrilled that all of you have come out today to have a conversation and to engage in a workshop with the wonderful, wonderful staff that are in the Disability Resource Center. I want to thank our partners in Student Affairs, Sylvia Hutchinson, Karen Calavoto, for helping us put all this together, as well as our presenters, um, Tricia, Marianne, and Bob. Thank you so much. I don't need to do anything more than hand it over to them. I will say that CTL has an ongoing series of faculty development. We'd invite all of you to pick that promotional piece up if you haven't already seen that. Coming up tomorrow, Audrey Haynes is presenting on using ELC. Um, and we'd love to see you there if you can make it to that. And with that, our presenters. Hi, all. Um, I'm Tricia Barefield. We're going to start off today uh, with just a, a quick table activity. So with the people at your table, if you look at the test your knowledge sheet that I just handed out, does everyone have one of these? Um, so we're just going to take two minutes and this first section, just these first four questions, just take a look at those and think about what you uh, believe the best answers for those would be. So just two minutes and we'll get back together. Uh, let's get back together and see uh, what you all thought. So for, for question one, why do we provide accommodations? Uh, anyone, uh, what, what do you believe the answer is? Because we miss out on the wonderful things those students can contribute if we didn't. That's a great answer. I thought so. <laughs> <laughs> anyone have anything to add to that? OK, DRC staff. Yeah, the ADA, is that what you said? The ADA, uh, that, that, is, that is exactly correct. That's where we're going to start today. Uh, so this is going to be the briefest overview of the uh, legal side of why we provide accommodations. Uh, so the se Section 504 of the Re Rehabilitation Act of 1973 and then the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990 as amended in 2008. Um, for Section 504, uh, this is the, the baseline, this is where we start. Uh, this prohibits organizations that receive federal funding from excluding individuals with disabilities. Now, this is important because UGA receives federal funding. UGA does not want to lose that federal funding. Uh, with the ADA, um, this prohibits public entities like UGA from excluding individuals with disabilities because of their disability. Uh, now, this is more specific to educational access, um, and it, it requires reasonable modifications for qualified individuals. Um, like I said, the briefest overview. If you would like more information, um, Please see the uh, presentation that Claire Norens from the Equal Opportunity Office and our Associate Director Pat Marshall will be giving uh, next month through training and development. Um, so question two, um, what types of disabilities do we see on college campuses? Feel free to shout it out. All of them. All of them? <laughs> what, <laughs> what, what, what is all of them? Physical, visual, auditory, yes, that's definitely what we see. Um, and anxiety, yes. Uh, PTSD, certainly. Autism spectrum disorder, definitely. What was that? I'm sorry? Processing delays. Processing delays, processing disorders, definitely. Um, and I phrased that in a specific way. What do we see? Because the first things you think about are physical impairment, like mobility impairments. Uh, you think about uh, st students who have uh, sign language interpreters, students who are blind, that, that's the first thing that you might think of. But in reality, our population, uh, ADHD is our largest population with 36%. Um, it, it used to be that learning disabilities was our second. Um, in the last few years, we've seen a shift. And now psychological is the, uh, our second largest student population. And that's uh, very much a lot of anxiety, things of that nature. Um, after that, chronic health. Um, so we might see students who are going through chemo, um, anything like that. Any questions on our student population? Now, this is just the students who are registered with our office. By no means are all the students who have disabilities at UGA registered with us. Um, if a student comes to you and wants accommodations but isn't registered with us, please direct them to our office so that they can go through the proper channels to receive accommodations. Um, yes? Oh, yeah, go, go ahead. How common is it to put that in this, the uh, course outline, the syllabus, the information about seeking accommodation? Uh, so so the, que do that or not? Uh, the, the question is about um, syllabus statements. 
Um, well, you should put a statement in your syllabus stating that equal access is going to happen in the classroom. Uh, we have a variety of, of sample statements on our website that instructors can choose from, but that is something that instructors should be doing. Does that answer your question? For the Display Resource Center? That, that is very beneficial if they know exactly where to contact us, because uh, some students just might not know what's available to them at the university. Any other questions? Okay, so uh, question three is um, a true or false statement. It is ultimately the instructor's decision if a student receives accommodations. What do you think? False. That is generally false. Uh, we need to provide accommodations to uh, students who they've been uh, approved for. Um, the only gray area is making sure that it doesn't modify the core course requirements of the course. Um, if it's a public speaking course, we might have to be careful about a student who isn't supposed to be uh, asked to speak aloud in class, that kind of thing. But in those situations, contact our office, get in touch with our disability coordinator, and we can work those out. Um, question four, true or false, an instructor can ask for documentation of a student's disability. false. Um, for this one, uh, you can ask for, uh, say, say a student that has a disability is then just like has the flu, you can ask for a doctor's note in that case. But if it's disability related, um, it should go through our office. We are the uh, sole house, you know, house of uh, disability documentation on campus. So we keep in line making sure that, um, you know, students information isn't uh, in any way. It's all confidential. Um, we're under HIPAA and FERPA, and we're very committed to confidentiality. Um, so, so all disability documentation should go through us. So Trish, as a faculty member, I get a documentation from you, but I don't ask for documentation from their psychologist or their medical doctor. Right? You, you would not receive the documentation. But I would receive documentation from your office saying that the student has a disability. Correct. Okay. Um, and, and that's a, a, a pretty good segue. Um, I gave you all this, uh, this packet, looks like this. Um, what you would receive is this accommodations letter. Um, and I'd like to go over what goes into getting this letter. Uh, before you get this letter, the student would have to see a, a qualified professional. Uh, they would have to get a diagnosis. They would have to have a, a report and proper paperwork sent to our office stating their diagnosis, functional limitations, uh, you know, uh, recommended accommodations from that, that provider. Um, then they'll meet with someone in our office and we'll determine what accommodations they need at UGA. So before you get this piece of paper, there's a lot of work that goes into it. Um, so, so please, when it comes to these accommodations, trust that we've done our due diligence that the, the healthcare provider, the, the tester, whoever it is, has done their due diligence. And when you receive this piece of paper, um, it's, it's you know, important to, to respect these accommodations. Any questions on that? OK, so um, really what I just wanted to go through is the three most common forms you might see. Um, so the first one is the, the professor letter or accommodations letter on the front that I just went over. Um, it, it only has the accommodations listed, never disability. Uh, the second one, since I'm testing coordinators, near and dear to my heart, this is the testing accommodations form. Uh, newly revamped, hopefully a little easier to follow. Um, there's a section for the student to fill out. Notice that the dates and times are under the student section. Uh, if at all possible, please put on your syllabus what the dates of the tests are. It makes it easier for the student to know when to uh, let us know. The earlier, the better. Um, last semester, we completed like 4,300 tests. Uh, there were over 4,500 scheduled, um, but then some no-shows. So um, we have a small center. We do a lot of work. And the earlier you get that information to us, the better. Um, to be com completed by the professor, this section, I've, I've literally circled it, hopefully to make it easier um, for, for uh, you to know what part you need to do. Um, please make, make sure you tell us what types of materials you're using. If you think that, you know, 
it's, it's obvious that the students get a calculator for your class. We don't know that. We won't give them a calculator unless you tell us that we're going to get a calculator, that, that they get a calculator. Um, same thing with delivery. Um, just make sure that we know where, how you'd like, it, like the test delivered. Um, any questions on testing? Once again, kind of a brief overview. It's, there's, there's a whole lot of nuance, so just let me know. The most common test accommodation most likely is time and a half. Um, students that just need a little extra time, whether that be because watching the clock go down um, gives them anxiety um, or the fact that they have a processing disorder or something along those lines. Um, note taker form. This is something that a lot of instructors are familiar with. Um, typically you'll get a packet of all three of these if a student has a note taker and testing accommodations. So the note taker form, we try and make this as easy for instructors as possible. There's a little blurb up here. All you have to do is read this in front of the class. Uh, there's a student in this class who requires a, a, a note taker. If you're interested in making $80 this semester, please come up to the front of the class at the end of the, this session. Um, from that point, and, and please, when you read this, don't point to the student. Don't, you know, hey, this student over here has a disability and needs, please don't do that. Um, they can meet up after class. Um, the, this, the student who's registered with our office can um, hopefully look at the notes of the people who come up and choose which one is best for their style. We want this to actually be beneficial for the student. Any questions just generally on uh, accommodations or classrooms? Or? The students ever come and register with you just let you know that they'd be willing to be a note taker before and then just hope to get matched up or is it always through the instructor? Uh, the, the instructor announces, uh, the, the question was um, if students ever come to us to volunteer to be a note taker before, beforehand. Uh, no, the, the instructor just announces it. We have some note takers who are note takers for multiple classes. They can also be the note taker for multiple students and they just make an extra $40 per extra student. Um, with that, I'm going to pass it off to Marianne and she's going to tell you a, a little bit about her area. Thank you, Tricia. Um, if you guys want to take a look at section two and the questions there, take about a minute to look at those. Looks like you guys are all set. Um, so the first question, we always know well in advance if a student who needs an accommodation such as alternative text or caption media will be in your class. How many think this is true? How many people think it's false? You are correct. Um, our students do have access to priority registration and they take advantage of that. But like any student at UGA, they have the opportunity to do drop ad. And so you may end up with a student in your class on the last day of drop ad that needs um, accommodations that are gonna affect the content of your class, such as alternative text or captioned media. So I'm gonna take a few minutes and talk about universal design, which is a design principle that's come out of the field of architecture as buildings were being retrofitted for ADA became clear that creating access and accessibility within the design at the beginning of the design process was more cost efficient and more effective than adding it after the fact. So North Carolina State University has come up with seven principles of universal design which is applying to the field of architecture but I feel like they also can be applied to designing curriculum, so I thought I'd go over them a little bit with you. So principle one, equitable use, is talking about making sure that you don't stigmatize or segregate the student like we talked about with the note taker forms, that we don't point them out. They are part of the class, and that is a key component of equal access. On principle number two, flexibility in use, is making sure that you provide a wide variety of methods of use such as if you have a pair of scissors, they can be used both by a right-handed person and a left-handed person. So you've designed something that works for both sets of people. Principle three, I felt like applied best to when working with curriculum, that having unnecessary complexity, accommodating a wide range of literacy and language skills, and arranging the information consistent with its importance is very applicable to thinking about working in a classroom. So these principles have been incorporated into a pedagogy and um, the organization cast.org has done a really good job of doing that. Um, 
And they've distilled it into three main ideas. And those ideas are multiple means of representation. So how you interact with the student. Doing not just lecture, but providing in-class discussion, or possibly online discussion, or group work with the students. And then having multiple means of action and expression, how the students interact with you. So not just testing them to assess their knowledge, but providing other means for them to interact with you, such as um, maybe doing a short essay or, um, answer, or short answer question or a quiz at the beginning of class, or doing a portfolio or another type of project that helps them um, display their knowledge of your content so that you can be sure that they're being able, that they're gaining the information. Because testing isn't always the most efficient way for some, some learners. They like to be visual or some other method. Multiple means of engagement. Um, so we're going to look at question number two now and start talking about my area of expertise, which is caption media. So we've talked a little bit about how to design your classroom. Do you guys have any questions, by the way, about universal design and ideas behind it? OK. <laughs> um, so as you're selecting your materials and creating a class, um, we recommend that you select captioned media from the start because having it ready makes you prepared for when a student comes into your class, um, especially if it's on the last day, because providing captions is a very time-consuming uh, process, and it can delay the content in your class. So which of these answers do you think is probably correct? <laughs> that is correct. But I will say that all of these are um, real instances that have taken place uh, through our office on campus. Um, and I especially want to emphasize that YouTube's automatic captions do not count as access. They are currently not, as, not accurate enough to be considered equal access, and they don't even have punctuation, so they're very difficult to follow. So if you've chosen a YouTube video, it will still need to be captioned. So we're going to do a little fun exercise and let you guys watch a video and see if you can figure out what this video is about. This is an actual example that was used in a class. Steroid hormones are chemical substances secreted by glands throughout the abdomen and involved in the regulation of a variety of functions, including sodium balance, metabolism, and reproductive functioning. You might have also had difficulty understanding the voice. It's a computerized voice, and uh, we found it very difficult to hear the audio when we were doing the captioning which is one reason that um, captioning is an important thing to add to your videos from the onset, because you never know what kind of situation you're going to be in the classroom, whether your sound system is going to be working correctly, or if the video that you're using is going to function correctly as well. So it's not just for students that are deaf and hard of hearing. Now, in our office, that's who we provide accommodations for. But it, it's very beneficial to all the students in your class. And research has shown that captioning aids in comprehension because the students are getting not only the visual feedback, but also the audio feedback. And it's really, um, especially applies to students with learning disabilities and students with ADHD. But it can work for all your students to have them concentrate and focus in your class, which, um, and also if the student is, um, English is a second language for them, this will also help them be able to understand the media better because they're having that second channel of feedback. And then if you're in a situation where you're creating the content, such as in a flipped classroom and creating podcasts that are accompanying the material in the class, having a transcript and having a caption track added to your video makes it much more accessible for your students, it makes it searchable and discoverable for them. They can go into that video and search the transcript for the concepts that, you're talking, that they may have missed or may have questions about, and it will jump to that point in the video and play from that those words, which is um, very helpful for when you're doing a flipped class and students are doing review in their home. So I really recommend that you add captions to your content and look for captioned content. So here are some resources, and they're also on the handouts um, that we're, we have. Um, Amara is a website that allows you to overlay captions to any video. So it doesn't have to be, if you're not the content owner, you can still add captions to it. But they also have a library of videos that have already been captioned. So you can search that library by topic and see if there's something 
that applies to your content. Um, and that's the same with dot sub. And then for TED Talks, I often get the YouTube link to the TED Talk. Well, on the TED website, they offer subtitles in a lot of different languages, actually. And so if you find a talk that you want to use, just go back to the original website, and they'll have a captioned version available. You can use YouTube to, um, to add captions. And if you load it in there, it will do the automatic caption. So it's going to pick up your voice and do the translation. And then you can go in and edit it and change and um, adjust all the, the mistakes because there probably will be, especially for technical information or um, scientific words. Um, and then add punctuation, because that's one thing that's always going to be left out with YouTube. But they actually have a really good widget that does that. You can adjust the timing, and you can adjust the words. So it's pretty sophisticated, if it, if it is your content that you have. Um, yes, for doing like a voice recognition. Amara, um, you would still have to create your own transcript. And it's designed to let you do like short segments throughout the process. So um, in one way, you're creating the captions and the transcripts at the same time. So it might be a little bit faster, but. Even our service on campus, so we'll do that for uh, we do it for students that are deaf and hard of hearing at the DRC if the student is in your class and has an accommodation. Um, but currently, there's not any one source. Though CTL does have software that they offer called Screencast-O-Matic, which to use the software, you have to create a script. And you read off the script to create your podcast. And then that has like taken half the task of creating your captions. Any other questions about? And I do want to talk about Films on Demand. Do you guys know about Films on Demand? Because it's one of my favorite resources. It's through the library. So you actually have to go to the library website, into the databases, then find Films on Demand. So it is a path. But they have lots of films that have been captioned. And you can actually request captioning if there isn't captioning available. And they respond within two to three days. Um, and they offer segments of those movies, so if you're not going to use something full length, you can use a short segment. So I'm going to pass it off to my colleague, Bob, who's going to talk about alternative text. Hi. So yeah, I, I run the alternative text office at the DRC, which uh, we provide accessible textbooks and uh, other required readings for students who are receiving the alternative text accommodation due to a print-related disability. And that's one of the more kind of obscure accommodations that you might not have a, I guess, everyday understanding of, like closed captioning or come across it with testing and note taking and whatnot. So alternative text is provided to students who um, have a print related disability, which can be a number of things, including learning disabilities, ADHD, uh, sometimes mobility impairments, if they're not able to carry a huge backpack full of books or uh, visual impairments. And we basically work with the students one-on-one -on -one to figure out which format is going to work best for them. So we can convert a physical textbook into uh, an e-text, which they can access with a screen reader program or other assistive technology. We can also create an audiobook version or more than likely go to outside sources for that. We can do large print. We also have the ability to do Braille as well. So basically, when a student is assigned a textbook that is not commercially available uh, in an accessible format, we will step in and process that and provide that for them. If, as an instructor, however, you're providing materials in class or posting them online, it's ultimately your, responsible to make sure, your responsibility to make sure that all your students can access those documents. So I think I have some examples just illustrating what an inaccessible document might be. So how might this pose an obstacle to a student trying to read this in your class? Blurry, hard to read. It's, uh, yeah, a bit, a bit. Um, this is actually, these are all examples of things that we, our office has processed. For one, it's oriented wrong. You, this pops up on your screen for everybody. That's just a pain to try and like, go in, navigate, flip it around. Barely fills two thirds of the page and you have, it's a double page scan. They just laid the book flat on the scanner and or actually it looks like they just made a Xerox and at some point later on they scanned that in. Ideally, what you would want to do is, for one, uh, scan one page at a time, uh, zoom in or crop that so that the entire page is filling the entire screen, 
and that allows the text to be a more readable size, better quality. And what that can, the problem that, that blurry text can uh, lead to is if you're trying to access that with a screen reader, um, I'll show you an example here. This first bit is the original text and one of our uh, screen reader programs, Read and Write Gold, trying to interpret that. And it's gonna immediately go into the finalized process document that we provided, same program, reading that. B C B L L L B B I X B L M C M L O R D D J and D T R I S N I T I F one L M N D N D N now Al K I K A L M B U M A L Scene six Mitch Yes how much I weigh Blanche Blanche Oh I'd say in the vicinity of one hundred and eighty Mitch Yes again Blanche Not that much So yeah I mean you can see it. Entire sections of text were skipped, and it was just gibberish. So, that's um, here's. So you have to retype it? We, you get that? Sometimes we do have a few programs that can go in and do it, it. The program will do its best to interpret what's on the page, and then we have the ability to go in, edit the text, uh, make corrections, and then produce an entirely new PDF that is accessible from the original material. In cases like this, not even that program can like interpret what's on here because it's just a you know it's a big gray blurry mess. So cases like these, sometimes we are literally just retyping the entire document. Uh, but if that's what it takes, you know that's what we're going to do. But this is an example of for one, uh, very poor quality scan. Odds are it was a there's some sort of color background with uh, black text on there. But when you Xerox that, it just you know you lose all contrast. And that's definitely an issue for students with visual impairment who require that ability or, you know, students with um, reading comprehension issues. It's, yeah, it just does not work for anyone, really. Yeah. All right, here's one more example. Okay, so this is um, an instance where a web page was printed out and then Xeroxed and handed out, which um, presents a number of issues. Uh, you, there's way more information on there than is necessary. A lot of it is just completely lost because you know, there's no color or anything there. The graph is inaccessible. The data there is completely you know, inaccessible to students with screen reader, just the information is not there. Uh, you lose the color, you lose the numbers. And a lot of, this is um, a good example of an instance where the original material is still online. This is an article from seven years ago, I think. It's still there. and. Um, the graph itself, if you click on that, it's accessible on the website. All the information is there and accessible to screen reader technology. All right. So yeah, those are some of the, uh, the worst case scenarios. That's what we're trying to avoid. Um, when you are providing accessible text in your classroom, a few tips that we can hopefully uh, impress upon you. Uh, select your books and materials early. Uh, you're not gonna know if you, your student is in all has the alternative text accommodation more than likely until they pre present their pr professor letter to you. Um, so you want them to be able to find out what books uh, they need that, to request from us. That'll be ideally on, for, available from the Athena or from the, books, uh, the bookstore. Uh, they can get that material to us. We can have their materials ready uh, by the first day of class, ideally. And as far as accessible materials you plan on handing out in class and online, you want to make sure that an accessible version is available to the student with print-related disability at the same time as the original document is to everyone else. They, you know, an equal education pretty much means they have the same amount of time to study the materials. They have the uh, same ability to participate in class discussion as everyone else. Oh, go back one. All right, yeah, so other things uh, we would ask. Try and find the original published documents. If you have an old scan or something like that, especially if it's like a journal article or web page or magazine article, odds are you can find an accessible version online, whether it be through JSTOR or the original publisher website. A lot of those are available and more than likely they are gonna be accessible. If you can't find that, uh, if you can scan your original material, like if you're just using a book that you just really prefer the older edition or something along those lines, it's out of print, Try and get a high quality color scanner. You know, scan it one page at a time, make an intern do it. Um, but you know, the better, the better quality, uh, the, you know, the more accessible it will be in the, in the long run. And finally, you know, with those materials as well as other digital files that you have already, 
Uh, see if you can you know, just make those accessible. Um, the easiest way to do that, this is an original scan we got this semester, uh, just try and highlight some text. If the entire image highlights, like on the right there, it's not accessible. There's, it's just a picture of a page. It's not, there's no text there as far as the computer is aware. So that would not be accessible by a screen reader. Uh, once you run an optical character recognition or OCR process, you'll be able to highlight, it'll, the computer will basically read the text, embed that data into the document, and you'll be able to highlight text and it'll be, uh, the computer will read it. Um, that is a process that, there is software on campus you can use to do that. Uh, Acrobat Pro has it built in. Uh, it's not gonna be perfect, but the better the quality, um, the, the better it is gonna, it's gonna be. It doesn't guarantee accessibility though, so if a student does have issues with that, we can always step in and help out. All right, um, so we have made available an accessibility checklist to help out with that, as well as you know, designing a course with accessibility in mind. It's got everything on there from like what you should, how to make an accessible syllabus, you know, those links to the accessibility statements. Uh, it's all available on our website uh, under the faculty section. It also has links to some more like technical step-by-step -step how to make your documents accessible as well. All right, so the, the, the teeth, here we go. Um, why should we care about this kind of stuff? There, are, there have been a few recent uh, cases in which um, other institutions did not maintain certain accessibility standards as required by the ADA or 504. Uh, University of Montana, a couple of years ago, they were, uh, a complaint was filed with the U.S. Department of Education by, I think this is the Alliance of Disabled Students at the University of Montana. I think that's what that acronym means. Anyways, it was an entire, um, a number of students who had issues with their online learning management system, their version of eLearning Commons basically, which had all of, th that distributed all of their course content. It also had their uh, you know, chat rooms, uh, online forums. Everything was inaccessible for um, students with like visual impairments or print related disabilities. Their entire uh, course registration website was inaccessible. Uh, documents posted online and provided in class were inaccessible. Videos shown in class and online, those were not captioned. And they used the inaccessible clickers. So that was a wide variety of violations, which you know, basically students had had enough. They filed that complaint and that is still lingering. That's still under investigation in Montana. UC Berkeley, that was a case where uh, the, their version of the alternative text office, basically they were not able to provide course materials in time. They were understaffed, underfunded, and they had poor uh, communication with the instructors. They were getting materials at the last minute. Instructors were not telling their students which books they needed. Uh, and as a result, um, fortunately, they were able to work with the uh, disability rights advocates, a third party, to reach a settlement. And that uh, put in place a pretty, they, they caught up big time. They are now able to process materials in less than 10 business days. Uh, and all of their campus libraries, they are now able to basically provide everything in an accessible format within a couple of days. They, have, they also have uh, these self-service self scanning stations, which are, it, that particular program is like the first of its kind in the nation. Um, and also, the faculty are now strongly encouraged uh, to make course materials available full six weeks before the class begins. That'll give students the ability to request the materials and their office the time to process them. So they're pretty serious. There are some, yeah, a few penalties involved there. And then Louisiana Tech, this, this is uh, not good. Okay. So their, their version of, um, I think web assign is probably the closest thing we have here, but my OM lab was used in a math class. It's an online platform where students take their tests and get their homework and it's graded completely inaccessible, especially for this particular student uh, who was uh, completely blind. Uh, they raised the issue to their instructor. Instructor told them to just go to the software developer and deal with them. They tried that, they, had, they got no results, and it was a full month before they eventually felt they were, uh, the student was too far behind and he was forced to drop the class. Um, later on, that same uh, student took a different class with the same instructor, and that instructor was handing out uh, course materials in the classroom for use that day uh, for a class discussion, as well as like giving out study materials and stuff like that in an inaccessible format. Uh, the student was not able to work things out with the instructor, aside from the instructor telling another student to do it for them. 
In any case, they weren't getting accessible materials until several days after the fact. So they, they just didn't have that you know, real-time equal access. They had less time to study, less time. They weren't able to participate in class like any of their classmates. And he raised, a, uh, he you know, filed suit. Definitely, they, they won a sizable a cash award. And the thing is that that resulted in new accessibility standards, not just for that particular school, but for the entire Lu University of Louisiana system. So, yeah, I mean, that's kind of why this is important. You know, they're not the only ones. This is happening, you know, is, especially with emerging technologies, which, you know, unfortunately, accessibility is not always the first thing in mind. It's usually campuses are adopting what's, you know, newest and flashiest and shiniest. They're using these tools and they're not maintaining the accessibility standards that they're required to. And when they do that, you know, whether it's the institution or the professor, it's not the individual professor or the department that is, you know, facing these lawsuits. It's the entire university or the entire system itself. So yeah, I think that is about it. Um, <laughs>